Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the New York Amsterdam News and the League of Women Voters of New York State, presents Race to Represent, an MNN election initiative. Hello, I'm Eleanor Tatum. New Yorkers will be voting in the general election on Tuesday, November 6th. They will cast their ballots for offices including governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, controller, state legislature, and state assembly. Today, we bring you an interview with one of the candidates running for New York State Assembly in District 72. The winner will take office in January 2019. The New York State Assembly works alongside the state Senate and the governor to create laws and establish a state budget. The 72nd district represents approximately 130,000 residents. It covers parts of the Bronx and northern Manhattan, including Inwood and Washington Heights. Joining us now is the Democratic candidate and incumbent assembly member, Carmen De La Rosa. Welcome. So what three words would you use to describe yourself that would identify you as the better candidate on election day? Well, I'm a product of my community, so that would be one thing. Um, I am someone who considers herself to be hardworking um, and trustworthy. And what were the biggest obstacles you faced this term and how will you prepare for these obstacles in the future? This was my first term in Albany. Um, obviously going up to Albany for the first time as a legislator, I had to learn the rules of um, Albany, how the institution works and how to get the budget passed. I think that the budget is a very complex document. Um, I'm prepared this year um, to continue learning this process and to make sure that my community gets the resources that it deserves in this new budget process which starts in January. So during your first term you drafted 15 bills and you co-sponsored a, a dozen others introduced by the assembly. This is your second term. What other bills um, do you plan to sponsor? What are some of the bills that you did sponsor? Uh, whether they uh, did they pass and uh, where are they now? Where, what, yes. where do they so stand? I have a lot of plans for this next session. Um, some of the things that are the most important for me to focus on in this upcoming session is the housing laws. Um, my community has one of the largest rent stabilized um, stocks of rent stabilized apartments in New York State and 2019 will be the year where we will once again take up the rent regulation reform package of, of bills. I'm on the housing committee. Um, in my community, it's very important to stand up for tenants' rights to make sure that um, the displacement that has been happening in our communities continues to um, be addressed and that the concerns of the residents who have been longtime residents of Inwood, Marble Hill, and Washington Heights are brought to the table. So I will be focusing a lot on housing issues, on how to empower the voices of tenants, um, and I will also be continue to fight um, for the DREAM Act to pass. I'm the main sponsor of the DREAM Act in the Assembly. I think now, especially now with the attacks we're seeing on immigrant communities coming from Washington, I want to make sure that as we have a Democratic State Senate, we can um, usher that legislation through. Now, you had just mentioned the, the budget process, and it's going to be starting soon. Um, and New York State has a $168 billion budget. Um, what issue in your district would you like to see get more funding? We need to do a lot more when it comes to education um, in the district. Uh, my district has historically be, been one of the districts that has been underfunded. Um, we've talked a lot about the formula for funding public school education. Um, it's, I think it's time to look back at that formula and see how we can continue to increase the investments happening there. Um, youth development, recreational development. Um, oftentimes I get visited by groups who are doing work um, with youth in the community. Um, criminal justice reform is something that we see that in our communities has a deep impact. And so working to make sure that those issues are brought to the table is important. I'm on the mental health committee um, and addressing the issues of mental health in communities of color has been a priority for me. Increasing access for families who have children with autism, for example. I drafted legislation that does that. But I think we also have to put budgetary um, implications, budgetary allocations in, um, in this process to make sure that that access reaches our community. Um, also with the criminal justice system, I sponsor legislation that reinstates the uh, bus transportation system for incarcerated individuals. 
up until 2013, the state of New York had a free system of, of busing family members of inmates to visit their families. That system was um, taken offline in 2013, and we need about $2 million, um, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the $3 billion budget for the Department of Corrections to bring it back online. Um, I'm working with the Osborne Association to make sure that families who have incarcerated family members, especially children, are able to make visitation easier, closer to home, make sure that people are housed closer to home. I believe that children have a right um, to visit with their parents and have that lifelong relationship. So I'll be focusing on those things in this upcoming budget. And now, what kind of campaigning have you done around your district um, during this election? Well, you know, I, I did a lot of campaigning for the primary. I, vis I visited senior centers. I met with tenant leaders. Um, I have a large contingent of women in my community who are very politically active and engaged. Um, and so we've been meeting with them. Just, you know, going to the subway stations, visiting the uh, places of worship, um, and just making sure that everyday residents of the community know what are the issues, listening to them about what are the issues that affect their daily lives and know that we have ideas for solutions to and, those issues. And what are you hearing from them? What are, what are their primary concerns? You know, housing is the number one issue in my district. It's one of those districts where people say it's one of the last remaining communities um, in Manhattan. And uh, just the pricing out of long-term residents is something that's so concerning. I would say that 90% of the people who walk into my district um, are at or below the poverty line. And so with the increasing prices of rent, um, everywhere you go, you hear people who are talking to you about that burden of, of having to pay for rent when you're on a fixed income or on a limited income. Also, we're losing a lot of um, the professional uh, native community that was there. So if you're someone who has a higher degree and you've um, now moved to another community where you can afford to live maybe on an entry level position or right out of college. And so we're losing a lot of our young professionals in the community and parents are concerned about their children moving away um, and further out of, of the state and further out of the community. So that's something that I hear a lot about, but it's mostly about the rising prices of rent. Now, what bill are you most proud of having accomplished in your first year? Well, the, I would say the one that, the two that I'm most proud of, they're like your children, you can never pick one. But um, the one, the two that I'm most proud of is the Suicide Prevention Council. Um, I drafted legislation that would create a, a Suicide Youth Prevention Council. Um, in communities of color, Latina girls and um, African American boys have the highest indexes of suicide um, tendencies, uh, ideation towards suicide. And we are seeing that in Latina girls, for example, 25% of Latina girls in New York State have seriously considered or attempted suicide. And so we've been working with organizations such as, as Community Life to draft this legislation and make sure that an advisory board is formed with experts in how to get prevent, preventative information into the communities. You know, in the Latino community, for example, um, it's a taboo to talk about um, having a mental health issue or suicide. And so we're trying to break that stigma and really bring um, life-saving measures into our community. So this council will be able to look at marginalized, traditionally marginalized communities, Latinas, African-American vets, the LGBTQ community, and prevention of suicide in those communities. And the second one is obviously the DREAM Act. Um, I'm so proud of that law, and I think that um, we need to make sure that education for me was the passport for me to get from where um, I was to where I am now. And I know that if it wasn't for that, college, that ability to pay for college, I wouldn't have been able to go to college. I'm the first person in my immediate family to graduate from college. I'm very proud of that. And I think we need to continue to give um, children, all children, irregardless of their um, status, documented or undocumented, the opportunity to go to college. Thank you. So where do you stand on the proposed Inwood rezoning plan? So I came out in opposition to the rezoning. And you know, it's no secret that I worked for the city council for five years and I worked for Councilman Rodriguez. It was a hard decision to, um, to say I'm against the rezoning uh, because of my relationship and my respect for the councilman. But I believed that b opposing the plan was the right thing to do for several reasons. First of all, the, the situation with the displacement that's happening in Upper Manhattan, especially in Inwood, didn't start now. It started, I would say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, our communities has been slowly displaced. But I believe that this plan moved too fast. 
And I believe that the concerns that the community brought about the how deep affordable the units that are going to be built were not addressed and so that was my fundamental um, disagreement with the plan in addition I also think that more investment needs to be done on in infrastructure if we're going to build up a community we need to make sure that the infrastructure of that community can sustain uh, this development so the trains the trains we know are a big issue traffic congestion in upper Manhattan is a big issue um, we had blackouts in the 90s we need to make sure that our grid and everything else is up to date to be able to withhold um, not only building and having a construction zone in our community but also an influx of families who would be moving in now can also the, the education system can that also sustain exactly right now our district is not one that is considered at maximum utilization based upon the numbers that the DOE uses I'm not quite um, in favor of the formula that the DOE uses to say if a school's overcrowded or not but what I do know is that there is a lack for example if you go into George Washington High School they there are 2,500 students in that school they don't have an up-to-date science lab they don't have a dance room they don't have some of the basic needs that a child who is learning and about to go into college to take chemistry courses would be able to enjoy and so I feel that if we're gonna bring more families into the district we need to make sure that the system that is there is of quality in order to sustain a new influx of students and not see overcrowded classrooms um, where children are not able to learn. All right, so keeping on affordability and neighborhoods and housing, um, you know, we're still still saying that Inwood has still been uh, labeled the last affordable uh, neighborhood in New York City. Uh, the median rent in that district increased 38 percent between uh, 2002 and 2014 compared with 24 percent citywide. Also fewer than 200 new units of housing have been built in Edwin over the last 20 years versus the 67,000 built in the rest of Manhattan. What do you say to tenant advocates who believe landlords who use preferential um, rent laws as a loophole to inflate apartment prices? Yeah, well, absolutely it's a double-edged sword, right? Because that statistic that our community under Bloomberg's administration did not receive, didn't build any affordable housing is true. And I think that was the impetus behind the rezoning to see how there could be economic development in that part of Manhattan but at the same time with increased development also comes the increased fear and the increased reality of displacement because when you build and you you're using a flawed formula once again which is the area medium income that is above that of someone who actually lives in the community so right now the average medium income that is used in Inwood is about sixty thousand dollars a year I know that the people that are walking into my office because they're at, in housing court make about $17,000 a year. They cannot afford to live in the newly built apartments that are going to be coming in. And so this is a big issue. The preferential rent loopholes exist. Um, that's part of the problem that has been exacerbated by inaction in Albany. Um, so we are pushing for 2019 to be the year with a Democratic State Senate where we can finally close some of these loopholes. The preferential rent loopholes are real. Um, I've signed uh, preferential leases um, and the reality is that some landlords are using that as a tool to say you can have this apartment for a thousand dollars and then when the lease is up they say well now your year is up you need to give me three thousand for someone who's on social security income or has or is working at a fast food restaurant there is no way that a person can go uh, sustain such an increase and so they are forced to move out of the community what we don't want to see is residents fee to feel like forced out because of this um, preferential rent loophole. So I support legislation. I'm a co-sponsor of the legislation that closes the rent, um, the preferential rent loophole. And I've spoken on the floor in Albany of the importance of closing these loopholes for my community. Now, what is your position on the legalization of marijuana and its impact on the judicial system? You know, the I am in favor of the legalization of marijuana for the reason that I feel that right now um, young men and women of color are being targeted um, f by, by the criminal justice system for um, the use of marijuana, the recreational use of marijuana. I'm not someone who advocates for drug use, but I do feel that when we see that in this criminal justice system, the people that are being targeted are minorities 
and people who would live in my community, then I feel that we have to do something to, um, to bring balance to that system. And the legalization of marijuana is something, you know, statistics show that um, most Americans have used marijuana recreationally um, in their adolescence. Um, I think that there has to be programs so that our youth are not drawn um, to drug use. We've seen what's happening with the opioid epidemic. But I think that we cannot target communities of color. Um, and, and with the legalization of marijuana, we will see that there will be a decrease in, um, in arrests made in our community, stop and frisks, and other practices, because now using marijuana won't be um, as penalized. Three quarters of Inwood's almost 43,000 residents are Latino, and Inwood contains the highest concentration of Dominican residents in the city. In fact, 175th Street and Broadway was recently declared Little Dominican Republic. How will your office work to protect Inwood from the negative impacts of gentrification? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a Dominican immigrant. I immigrated from the Dominican Republic when I was just a baby. And I'm so proud of um, the community that the, the, and the impact that the Dominican community has left in Upper Manhattan. I think that the de designation of Little Dominican Republic was something that made sense. Everyone already calls it Little Dominican Republic because everyone knows you can go uptown and get the best rice and beans, um, the best oxtail, and, and all the good foods um, that, are, that are natural to the Dominican community. But I think that the issue of the displacement of the Dominican community is a serious issue. Um, in my district, for example, about 77% of the 72nd district was made up of Dominican Latino immigrants. Um, I am sure that in the next census, we will see a change. And um, I am concerned about the displacement of the community because we've made and built a home there. Um, my office has lawyers that come to our office for free. They serve the community. When a person is in housing court, they can come to my office and receive services um, to make sure that that eviction is halted and that they know their rights. I think a lot of this is about educating our community so that they understand that they do not have to just accept, for example, a buyout from a landlord who says to them, here's $15,000, give me your apartment. Um, it's something real. When you talk about working class New Yorkers and working class immigrants, um, authority plays a big role in, in the decisions they make in their life. And so we want to make sure that people are educated. I have legislation um, that makes it, that informs tenants when a buyout has happened in their building. Um, what we're seeing with gentrification and the forces of gentrification is the flipping of buildings. So a landlord will buy my building today, two months later they sell it for a larger profit. Um, I think that residents need to be informed um, and I've drafted legislation to inform tenants of their rights when their building has been bought. Um, we're encouraging uh, the creation of tenants associations so people can gather and talk about the patterns of abuse or neglect that they see in their buildings and be empowered. It's a movement to empower the voices of tenants to prevent the displacement of our community. Now, like most neighborhoods in Manhattan, uh, you can't help but see the empty storefronts. And that is especially true in your district, on Broadway in particular. Yes. How do you suggest or do you plan to attract and keep local business owners? Well, a part of the discussion around the rezoning was just that. Um, how do we make sure that our small businesses feel that they are supported? Um, you know, commercial rent control is something that's being talked a lot about. Recently, I look forward to going back to Albany and engaging in those discussions. I think it's important for us to make sure that um, small businesses know that we appreciate them. In my district, um, the nightlife is um, the third largest employer after uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital and the nonprofit sector. And so we know that these small businesses are not only keeping that vibrancy of our communities, but also they're keeping our families employed. And so um, working in the assembly to make sure that small businesses, um, minority owned businesses are able to compete and are able to stay is a priority. Um, we're working with the Small Business Administration. Also, I've brought a few workshops um, to, to help businesses improve their business plans, to help them have access to legal services if they are being displaced. And oftentimes, we've even gotten on the phone with landlords who refuse to renew leases to say, this is a longstanding business and we would, it, we would appreciate your consideration of a renewal of their lease. So, you know, everything from as detailed as going in there and helping them negotiate a lease to giving them the tools to do that for themselves is really important. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. The general election is Tuesday, November 6th. 
For more information on voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates, you can visit our website, racetorepresent.com, or the League of Women Voters website, lwvny.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.